the advanced level English literature classroom of SBC Stylebex. So, today our lesson is To a Snowdrop by William Wordsworth. First, we are going to learn about the author, about William Wordsworth, who William Wordsworth is. I have mentioned only two points here. First one, from England, his era is 1770 to 1860. And the second point, a nature poet plus a romantic poet. Who is a nature poet? Who is a romantic poet? He belongs to both the categories. He is a nature poet and a romantic poet. Okay. Talking about William Wordsworth as a nature poet, he writes his poems based on different elements taken from nature. He observes the nature very carefully so that he can bring out different examples in his poetry pieces, literature pieces, so that he can give a kind of a good message to the society through it. He sees the beauty of the world looking at the natural aspects and he provides us such beautiful pieces of art and literature. So, he is a nature poet, a romantic poet. Is he a poet who writes love poetry? No, actually, it does not mean that he, being a romantic poet means, it does not mean that he is a, a poet who writes love poetry. The word romanticism the word, the term romantic in front of the word poet, it means that actually it has a different meaning from the words um, outer appearance. So when you look at the word itself, you will see that a romantic poet is somebody like this. No. In romantic poetry, what they focus is they look into the unprivileged men in the world. They look into the unprivileged men in the world and they compare the privileged and the unprivileged. They are more sensitive. These romantic poets are really sensitive. Not only being a nature poet, he is of course sensitive to the nature. Being a romantic poet, he looks at the human beings with a lot of empathy. So, this is about William Wordsworth. Right. Look at the two images. You can see a lonely flower. A kind of a charming image and here you can see yellowish flowers very really attractive okay if I question you uh, okay we'll see you go to a shop I want to buy a flower to uh, flower as a gift to your friend which flower you're going to choose these two flowers will be available which one you're going to choose this one or that one if it's me of course I'll definitely choose these flowers why? What is the reason? The reason is they are more attractive, they are more beautiful. The outer appearance, that's what we are going to look into. Right, so why I have chosen these two images in my poem today to a snowdrop? Yes, of course, this is a snowdrop flower. So William Wordsworth has taken this specific flower, not like me, who's going to choose these flowers, this flower to a snowdrop. Okay, I'll definitely tell you what this flower is. This is a type of a daffodil, which is there mentioned in the poem as jonquils. They are really attractive flowers. Okay, we'll see, we'll look into the poem and we'll try to understand what William Wordsworth tries to convey taking the two images of a snowdrop flower and jonquil flowers. Right. Here I have given you the poem. And um, yes, I'll recite the poem for you first. To a snowdrop by William Wordsworth. Long flower, hemmed in with snows and white as day, but hardy of far. Once more I see thee bend. Thy forehead, as if fearful to offend, like an unbidden guest. Though day by day, storms sallying from the mountain tops, waylay the rising sun. 
and on the plains descend. Yet art thou welcome, welcome as a friend who seal our Francis promise. Blue-eyed maid shall soon behold this border thickly set with bright jonquils, their odors lavishing on the soft west wind and his frolic peers. No, will I then thy mother's grace forget? Share snowdrop, when shall us harbinger of spring and pensive monitor of fleeting years? Okay, you see what Wordsworth is trying to convey through this. I told you taking the two images of the two flowers. Right, we'll see. Mm. Starting from the first line, okay, uh, before that, I want to show you the two parts of the poem. And I must tell, uh, I will further talk about the structural side of the poem in coming slides. So, this is uh, for the present purpose of explanation. This is a Petrarchan sonnet. This is a sonnet and it goes to the Petrarchan sonnet category. Right? So, now I'm going to um, take the structure, I mean, to show you the structure of the poem uh, in my explanation. Starting from the first line, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up to here. One part, and uh, starting from here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, the next part. Yeah, when I, when I say that, uh, I said it's a Petrarchan sonnet, you all are aware of what a Petrarchan sonnet is. In a Petrarchan sonnet, we have two sections. The first section, you call it a... Yeah. You call it... Octave. It's an octave. Or also you call it sometimes octet. You call it octet. And this part, you call it a sestet. You need to know the two parts. So, okay. Look at first, please focus on the first part, the octave. I'm going to describe, I'm going to explain the content, the meaning of the first part to you, then I'll explain the second part. Right. Now, now just see, William Wordsworth has taken a snowdrop flower, keep that in mind, and he's, he's uh, acting as the kind of the, the poet person, actually, you call poet persona. He, see, he speaks to this uh, snowdrop flower. Here, lone flower. Just imagine there's a um, snowdrop flower here, and I'm the poet person now. I'm going to speak to the flower, right? Okay, I'm, I'm speaking to the flower now. Lone flower, hemmed in with snows and white as they, but hardier far, once more I see thee bend thy forehead, as if fearful to offend. Like an unbidden guest up to here. Now he's talking to the snowdrop flower. Oh, snowdrop flower. You're really lonely. You're all alone. And the season is in between the winter season and the spring season. Now the flower has appeared in between the winter season and the spring season. Right? Now the poet persona, he talks, talks to the snowdrop flower and he says, Oh lonely flower, you are hemmed with snow, you are covered with snow because this is the winter season. And you are 
white in color like a snow. That, that is the real reason why it is called, why the name is given to it as a snowdrop because this appears in the winter season but still it remains until the spring comes, right? So here, hemmed in with snows and white as day, but hardier far. Not, it's not the fact that only that it is covered with snow. It's not the fact that it's suffering with the winter storms, but hardier far, once more I see the wind die for him. No, actually it's like, it's like not like that a person is um, talking to a flower, it's like a person is talking to another person. Why? The writer has used these kind of words, dying forehead. Do you, do you ever see a forehead? Can you figure out a forehead in a flower? No. Right, so it's obvious that the poet has used the technique of personification here personified, giving human figures, give human characteristics in order to beautify the content of the poem. So you see, die for head as if fearful to offend like an unbidden guest. Now recollect the image that you saw earlier in my slide. Now I know that you have the image there. A white flower which is bent all alone. And this is the winter season and the spring will be there in the next season and it's like standing there alone, right? That is the first explanation of that part. These four lines starting from here and from this full stop. Look at the next part. Though day by day, storms sally from the mountain tops. You know that it's winter. I told you that it's winter. Right? And you find it. storms, you experience storms sailing from the mountain tops or from the mountain tops, these storms are they are coming to your side. Just imagine a flower, a lonely flower experiencing a storm. Will it stay like stand straight and stay like this? No, definitely it will like shake that side, this side, and a lot of harassments. Right? So here. Storm Sally from the mountain tops. Now the next one. Where lay the rising sun? Interrupting the rising sun, the storms are sallying from the mountain tops towards you, my dear lawn flower. So remember, William Wordsworth is here to a snowdrop. Talking to a snowdrop flower. Right? So you see. We'll go further. We we'll lay the rising sun. The rising sun is also interrupted. And on the plains descend, but still you are there in the plains. Yet art thou welcome, welcome as a friend whose zeal outruns his promise. Okay, now this is the winter season. Snow, snowdrop flower, you are there and you are experiencing a lot of harassments from uh, them like I, I, I don't know I don't like to use the word uh, mother nature here nation a lot of harassments from uh, storms and uh, yeah you have here and also the for a flower sunny sunlight is really important but here uh, since it is the winter season that is also interrupted so just imagine uh, why this flower is like that? But still, it stands. It stands. It does not say that. Oh, I can't. I can't bloom. I can't bloom. No, it does not say like that. So um, that is it explained here. And here, this this line is really beautiful, very sensitive. Yet, even though you suffer a lot, yet art thou welcome, welcome as a friend, whose zeal outruns his promise. This part is a, a bit. Term. Sorrowful because you see, whose seal outruns his promise. The spirit of the flower. The spirit of the, the promise is given, the promise is made by the rising sun. Telling that you remain, I'll come. Right? But still, with the winter season, with all those harassments from the storms, 
Finally, when the spring season appears, the snowdrop flower actually it withers. It withers. That means these uh, snowdrop flowers appear in the winter season and they wait till the spring season. Right? So you have to imagine the situation of the poem where William Wordsworth has taken into his piece of poetry. Right. Um, what do you think? Uh, actually, William Birdsworth, he's, uh, he's uh, sympathizing with the, with the flower, snowdrop, sympathizing. That's why he says like this. Yet, art thou welcome? Welcome as a friend. You are welcome. You should be there. You should remain there. Even though the sun could not keep the promise. Right? Even though the spirit vanishes. Even though it withers, right? William Wordsworth, he says, Yet art thou, personified, Yet art thou welcome as a friend. Okay, and uh, still in the octet and uh, going to this line. Blue-eyed may shall soon behold This border thickly set with bright jonquils. Oh, now the flower came. Jonquil flower. The competitor, John Pilchlops, right? So I told you the two seasons, winter season and in spring season. Now, when the winter season disappears, the spring season arrives. That is the seasonal cycle of the world. Nobody can stop it, right? So here you can see blue-eyed May in April. Yeah, of course, in May you get the spring, right? In Europe. Right? So, blue-eyed May, the spring season, shall soon behold this border thickly set with bright jungles. Oh my god, when snowdrop flowers they wither, jonquils will come and invade the area, will appear and invade the area. Right? So, not only the invasion, Look at the different aspects of the invasion. Their odors lavishing on the soft west wind. Their odors, the smell of the flowers, the fragrance of the these um, jungle flowers are spreaded throughout the area. The attractiveness of this jungle flower is brought out by William Wordsworth, right? There are others lavishing on the soft west wind. Now, um, just, just think about the previous part. How snowdrop flower was uh, treated by nature. Stones are from the mountain uh, tops. Uh, it was like shaking to this side, bent and all. But to the jungle flower, it's not like that. On the soft, it's, it's soft west wind. It's a relaxing wind that the flower enjoys on the soft west wind and his frolic peers, west wind, west wind which uh, a person can experience in this uh, spring season in Europe. If you migrate, if you go to England, you could experience, right? West wind and his frolic peers. Who are the frolic peers of west wind? The butterflies, the bees, little tiny birds which come to suck the nectar of the flowers, right? So the frolic peers, the frantic peers, the friends of west wind, they are also coming and dancing around you, jonquil flowers, but not around the snowdrop, right? Next line. No, will I then, will I, poet persona, is like questioning, will I then thy mother's breast forget? Now he's, I remember he's talking to a snowdrop. Will I then thy mother's breast forget? Do you ever think, my dear snowdrop flower, that I will forget you? That I will forget your 
um, the modesty. That's a question. Right? Chaste snowdrop, winter's harbinger of spring, and the pensive monitor of fleeting years. That final two lines. Look at the final two lines. Chaste snowdrop. Look at this word. Chaste snowdrop. The use of the word chaste, talking about the purity of the flower. How pure the flower is. Chaste. Talking about the fidelity of the flower. Right? Venturous harbinger of spring. These are the terms used by William Wordsworth to talk to a snowdrop, to console snowdrop flower. Chair snowdrop, venturous harbinger of spring. You are the virtuous messenger of spring. You are the flower that announces, oh, the spring season is arriving. You are the virtuous harbinger, messenger of spring and the pensive monitor of fleeting years. You are really patient. You are a pensive monitor of fleeting years. Right? So that is the kind of the explanation which I can give you about the content of the poem. Right. I'll further go into kind of a small discussion or a description. Here, William Wordsworth has taken two flowers. I showed you the pictures earlier. A snowdrop flower and a jonquil flower. Now you have to think, is it only the fact that William Wordsworth is focusing on these two flowers, uh, the characteristics of these two flowers, but due to the seasonal changes, is it only that or William Wordsworth is trying to convey a kind of a huge message, kind of an indirect message to the audience that we have to think. Right. And um, okay, we'll go to the next slide and see what we can learn. The structure which I wanted to talk. Right? The structure, I, I told you earlier in the earlier slide that this is a Petrarchan sonnet which is consisted of an octave or you call it an octet plus a sestet. Octave means, octa means eight lines, sestet means six lines, you know that, right? So that is the um, content of a Petrarchan sonnet, right? The structural basis of the poem is that. Right? And I also want to talk about the rhyming scheme. Uh, we'll, we'll see in the coming slide whether we can, yeah, the techniques. Right? Here I'll talk about the, the rhyming scheme as well. Uh, sonnet form I described to you, right? How the writer is going to, uh, the writer has taken a particular matter in the society and how he's going to conclude. That's it. In a sonnet you find that kind of a problem is discussed and um, it, Kind of like in the final part, in the sestet, you find um, like kind of a the, the poet writes with a lot of wisdom, right? So that is uh, what you find in a uh, sonnet in the six lines, sestet, especially in the last two lines, right? Um, which is the couplet, right? So that is the sonnet form, and um, I told you earlier personification is used by William Wordsworth in the poem, personification I described to you earlier, personify means you give human figures, human characteristics to an inanimate object, right? So a flower is not a human being, so in personification the writer has the ability to give life, more life, kind of human life to um, an inanimate object. Through that uh, the writer is able to convey the message to the writer in a better way, right? Okay, so next technique which is used, metaphors. 
metaphors are there in the poem and imageries are there in the poem. Imageries. You have the visual imageries. What else? Um, you have olfactory example for visual imageries. Lone flower, hemmed with snow. You can visualize. You can visualize the image of a flower. So that you call visual imagery. Right? Then you have olfactory imagery. What is olfactory? Uh, what is the example? The fragrance of the jonquil flower. Others lavishing the area. So that brings to you the, the kind of the very pleasant smell of the flowers. If that you call olfactory imagery. Right? So techniques are there in the poem in order to make it more meaningful and to bring out the message and to beautify the language of the poem. The writer has used such techniques in this poem. Right. Next. Mm, the important part, themes and issues of the poem. Themes and issues of the poem. First theme that I have mentioned here is nature. Of course, William Wordsworth is a nature poet. And uh, it's, it's, it seem, it's really easy for you to uh, take down that nature is a theme. Why? The writer has taken a natural phenomenon in order to Describe. He describes actually nature. The reality of nature is described. Right? So that could be taken as a theme in this poem to a snowdrop by William Wordsworth. And the next one. Inequalities of society. Oh, now comes the writer is bringing out inequalities of society. Do you remember I told you that uh, William Wordsworth is a romantic poet? Poet? Yes, if he is a romantic poet, he will definitely talk about the inequalities of the society. Taking a lone snowdrop flower and a competitor, a jonquil flower. A competition between these two flowers. That's why I had uh, in my slide where you had the two images, I had verses in between. Huh? Like a competition. So, inequalities of the society where the poor men and women, how they suffer in the society. And how the privileged men, they enjoy and they are filled with everything and they have everything. So, they don't care a penny. They don't care to a penny about these unprivileged men. There are people like that in the society. Right? So, being a romantic poet, kind of a criti criticism is included in the poem. Kind of a criticism is here. Right? So, the inequalities of society could be taken as a thematic aspect of this poem to a snowdrop. Next one. Brevity of human existence. Brevity. How short the human life is. I don't know whether I will remain till tomorrow. That's the life, right? So the brevity of human existence is also brought indirectly to this poem, To a Snowdrop by William Wordsworth, the great poet, right? So you have to actually Really, these poems really interesting. They have a huge message to the world, right? So, other than these themes and issues, uh, you, my dear students, will also find out other themes uh, connecting to these main themes. So, no problem that you can add them to your answers when you write. You can um, jot down them, and when you come back to school, you can ask from me. You can discuss with the teacher, right? So. That's it about the poem. Um, thank you. Have a nice day. God bless you.